Hello and welcome to another edition of The Debate. I'm Kaveh Tahbaye. The United States is considering launching a military strike against Syria based on intelligence reports that Barack Obama has said with high confidence that chemical weapons were used by Assad forces, even without the UN report, which could take two to three weeks. A military strike, which the U.S. said would be limited, yet open to last 90 days. Meanwhile, the Russian President Vladimir Putin has said that U.S. Congress had no right to approve the use of force without a decision from the U.N. Security Council, and that doing so would be an act of aggression, with the Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister Faisal Muqtad to have said Syria will not give in even if there was World War III. The world is waiting to see whether the United States will go ahead with what its threats against Syria and officials in the White House have promised would be limited strikes on the country. The U.S. president still remains defiant to international calls to wait for U.N. inspectors to complete their report on an alleged chemical attack in Syria last month. Uh, the international community cannot be silent and that failing to respond to this attack would only increase the risk of more attacks. Uh, and that possibility that other countries would use these weapons as well. Congress will start debates over Obama's plan for a Syria military strike next week. But serious questions still prevail. Democrats and Republicans on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee have agreed on the content of a resolution that would give U.S. President Barack Obama the authority to attack Syria for a period of 60 days with one 30-day extension. The question now, how come a campaign that had been originally meant to be limited has now been extended to be conducted for 90 days? There's concern that Washington is preparing for a much bigger military action. And this has already raised objections from other world leaders. In line with international law, only the UN Security Council could sanction the use of force against a sovereign state. Any other pretext or method which might be used to justify the use of force against an independent sovereign state is inadmissible and can only be interpreted as an aggression. President Obama will have to ignore overwhelming opposition within the U.S. public opinion, as it was reflected in recent polls, in pushing ahead his plans to go to war in Syria. Nevertheless, the main points of criticism against him are that the U.S. is rushing into an action without thinking about its consequences, and more importantly, its attack on a sovereign nation comes without a U.N. mandate which is in violation of international law. The UN, the UN Charter principles about what may and what may not constitute an attack on another country only in self-defense. It makes it very clear on that. They can never do it preemptively or for any other reason. The Security Council alone has final say. That is U.S. law as well as international law. Obama intends violating it. It won't be the first time an American president did, but we're heading into another lawless war of aggression. Uh, it literally could start any time. I would imagine it will be sometime after Obama gets back from St. Petersburg Thursday and Friday for the G20 summit. In what many say is a messy handling foreign policy, one thing is certain to happen for the administration of President Obama. Washington's credibility, as Obama has said, is on the line. And that credibility could suffer as a result of Obama's performance over the Syrian case that's been anything but stable, coherent and clear. Let's see if we can get some clarity on this uh, topic from our guests. Let me introduce them. We have former U.S. Marine and war veteran Kenneth O'Keefe joining us from London. And Stuart Stogel, he's from Newsmax magazine, and he joins us from New York. Gentlemen, welcome. Stuart Stogel, I'd like to start with you. Obviously, so many things we could start with, but our starting point I'd like to start with is the Russian angle, who has rejected the U.S. evidence on this Syrian chemical attack. This is what the Russian foreign minister has said, Stuart Stogel. We were shown uh, certain pieces of evidence that did not contain anything concrete. He said neither geographical locations, nor names, nor evidence that samples had been taken by professionals. And he even said there were no facts. There's simply talk about what we definitely know, but when you ask for more detailed evidence, the U.S. says it's all classified, therefore it cannot be shown to us. Well, I think some of that's going to be clarified uh, this weekend in St. Petersburg. I have reason to believe that John Kerry will meet with Sergei Lavrov, who I happen to know for many years, uh, and will give him the details that he wants privately. It's going to be interesting to see when the G20 summit breaks up, 
uh, whether Lavrov and Putin change their minds. Kenneth O'Keefe, uh, let's talk about the U.S. military action. It's quite confusing. It went from a limited strike, initially said to last for 24 to 48 hours. Those are some of the statements coming from Obama. And now it seems like it's an open-ended 90-day timetable. What's your reading into that? Uh, General Dempsey saying it's not uh, bound to uh, uh, an immediate attack. It could be done in days or weeks from now. It almost sounds like this is much wider in scope than initially introduced. Well, the whole thing is... No, this is for Ken O'Keefe. I'm sorry. Uh, even at our end. Ken O'Keefe, go ahead. Sorry. Well, we have to have some semblance of understanding of what's happening here. And the idea that America would strike in a so-called limited strike is, is really quite ridiculous. The ultimate end game here is to get to Iran. And the only way to really realistically get to Iran is to eliminate Syria as a threat. Because if there is a war on Iran, Syria will also be able to attack uh, Israel, its uh, nemesis, in tandem with Iran. And this is the important aspect of eliminating Syria as a tactical threat. So to say that there are going to be limited strikes is, uh, is really just an insult to our intelligence yet again. Ultimately, this is really begging a third world war. And this is not a, this is not a joke. And, and everyone who's paying attention knows this. So every war supposedly is going to start off with limited action. But we, it will accelerate into a full scale war and potentially into a third world war. And it would be foolish to think otherwise. Well, Stuart Stogel, let me have your take on it. I mean, we're talking militarily about a buildup that's happening between the U.S. and Russia. Unless you have a reaction before I continue with my uh, uh, question to Ken O'Keefe. Yeah, well, I think the general knows full well, though he may not want to talk about it. It's pretty much understood what kind of a military campaign Obama is likely uh, to go forward with. My read from my sources at the Pentagon is that they're going to seek to neutralize the Syrian air defenses. Once those air defenses are neutralized, uh, the United States, perhaps with Turkey, are likely to declare a no-fly zone. What they will seek to do is to try and bring a more balance between the rebels and the Syrian government, and they'll try to do that by eliminating the Syrian air power. That becomes important, because without the air power, it's very hard for them to effectively deliver those chemical weapons in the future. Well, uh, let's talk about the air power then a little bit here, if you have any idea about it. From what I'm looking at, it's quite extensive. Uh, uh, we still have the big question that uh, lies in the heart of this, Stuart Stogel. I'd like to find out from you, do you think the Russian president is bluffing when it says that it has not delivered the S-300? Uh, only parts of it have been delivered. When you have the foreign minister, Walid Mu'alam, to have said we have surprises if we were to be attacked. Well, you know, I can also say that Interfax, the Russian news agency, also reported that they beefed up the um, Syrian air defenses with a specific intent on downing American cruise missiles. I think the biggest story here is that whatever kind of air defenses the Syrians have, if they are effective at shooting down even half of the American cruise missiles, that could cause a new wrinkle on this whole situation in Washington because cruise missile attacks and drone attacks have been a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy for about the last 10 years. Ken O'Keefe, one thing that's very surprising about all of this is, uh, again, I'm going to the military buildup that's uh, occurred, not to mention the, uh, uh, obviously what Syria has in its arsenal in terms of weaponry, in terms of uh, their air power, and that's Israel's security. Why would uh, what appears to be uh, U.S.'s uh, military attack, that's going to endanger that by retaliatory measures that perhaps might come from Syria? We can't forget what the... And I'm going to quote what the Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister, Faisal Maktoud, have said, that we will not give in even if there was World War III. Yes, I think it's really important for us to see the big picture here and, and really understand what's going on. The powers that be, which I will bring back to the bankers, those that control the issuance of money, these are the real powers, that's real power. As Baron Rothschild said in the 1800s, I care not what government's in power as long as I print the money. <laughs> if you want to know what power is, you need to know who controls the money supply. And those, those people who control the money supply control the politicians, they control the corporations, they control the mainstream media, they control every aspect of human society with rare exceptions. The countries that we see being attacked right now are those countries that are not bought and paid for by the banksters. So Iran and Syria, Venezuela was also being targeted for getting out of the IMF debt. Libya was also not part of this game. Iraq was also part of this game. We see a pattern here of who is attacked. Only those countries which are not part of the bankster system are the 
ones that are targeted. And this is very important for the rest of the world, especially those of us in the West, who are being told by our prostitute politicians that there's no money for social services, that we need to increase tuition fees, that pensioners who've worked their whole lives can't afford to even pay for gas and die from cold because the heating can't be turned on in their homes. There's no money for them, but we can bail out the bankers to the tune of trillions, and we can continue ceaseless wars. This is the big picture. This is the reality, and this gentleman in the United States is, is just absolutely delusional, or he's bought and paid for. Because the bottom line is, this is going to turn into a war which the banksters relish because the banksters make tons of money off of war. In fact, it's the best profit-making business of all. And, and even more importantly, it keeps us, people, divided. As long as we're fighting each other, we will not focus on who the real criminals inside psychopaths are, and those are, the t those are the, the ones at the top of the pyramid, specifically the banksters and all of the prostitutes that work for them. Stuart Sogol, uh, you know, it's quite uh, telling how the U.S. president has gone out of its way to try to get uh, approval, not only domestically but internationally. And we could talk about uh, the testimonies that, that have been given to the House Foreign Relations Committee by Chuck Hagel, by uh, John Kerry. Uh, uh, and overall, just uh, saying that, you know, with or without you, we're going to go ahead, but I'd like to get your approval, again, whether it's domestically or internationally. Why is he so insistent about going about getting this when he has even said that even if we don't get it, we're still going to go ahead with this military strike? Why does that seem to be something that is now taking up so much time and opening up uh, this window uh, of a timeline to attack Syria? Well, you've got the American off-year political elections next year. So Obama's being pressured by the congressional leadership, uh, the Democratic congressional leadership, to at least bring Congress into the fold on this. So at least the people who are running for re-election next year or for election next year have a defense. But getting back to what the general just said a few minutes ago, I assume his criticisms of all these bankers also include both Putin uh, and Lavrov. Uh, if he didn't know, for the record, before Lavrov took the job of foreign minister, he was going to work for the South African diamond cartel, De Beers, uh, hawking diamonds in Eastern Europe until Putin called to bring him back to Moscow. So I assume when he complains about the international bankers, he's also including the people in Moscow and the Kremlin also. Interesting point. Can yeah, I I'll respond to that? I have absolutely no problem. Go ahead. I have absolutely no problem whatsoever accepting I have no problem whatsoever accepting that the corruption that comes from the bankster system, the financial fraud that is usury, uh, debt-based money being issued by private bankers, it, it pervades every aspect of human society, including Russian society. There's no question about that. However, Russia is not going around the world setting up military bases uh, to the tune of over a thousand military bases and attacking everywhere and anything that's not down with the international bankster program. That's the United States that is doing that. And that brings us back to the real issue here as well with regard to the so-called use of, of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. This is absolutely insane to even be talking about this because if there's one nation on this planet that has no right whatsoever to point the finger at anybody for the use of weapons of mass destruction and including chemical weapons it's the United States because as we know with recent reports that have been levied from uh, CIA declassified reports about the CIA we knew full well that our attack dog Saddam Hussein was using chemical weapons against innocent people including the Kurds innocent people in small cities in Iran and hitting uh, military personnel in Iran to the tune of tons and tons and tons of Taban, sarin, and mustard gas. And guess what we did? The United States, when our attack dog was attacking Iran mercilessly with these weapons, not only did we not stop him, we continued to give him logistical support and we provided the means for him to continue these attacks. So we have no problem whatsoever with using chemical weapons. We used white phosphorus in Fallujah. We also used uh, ungodly amounts of Agent Orange in Vietnam. There are still people dying from cancers from those chemicals. Birth defects in Fallujah have gone through the roof. So the United States is in absolutely no position at all to be talking about the use of weapons of mass destruction or chemical weapons. And it is beggar belief that anybody could stand up and put forward the position of the United States that it is in any kind of moral position or authority to talk about this. If anyone needs to be punished, it's not the United States punishing 
somebody else. It's the entire world which needs to punish the United States for its continued act of aggression and its state-sponsored terrorism that has now killed a million to two million people in Iraq and continues to destroy lives mercilessly. It's the United States, America, and Britain, excuse me, the United States, Israel, and Britain, which is the real problem, not Iran and not Syria. Stuart Sogol, uh, many are saying that Israel is pushing the U.S. towards this. Do you agree? Uh, no, but I also got a more basic question. I'd like to know how many years the general served in the U.S. military. I served three years in the military, and if you want to take it in that direction, I have no problem answering any question about my time in service, including my no. combat service in the Marine Corps. Well, How much time have I'm you served in the military, only, and have you, been, to, have you been involved in a war? My, my only, well, I've, I've covered a war, but my question is very simple. Have you expressed those same views that you just expressed a few minutes ago when you were inside the U.S. military? No, I was a brainwashed idiot, like so many of us who've been indoctrinated for years and years, pledging allegiance to the flag, li with liberty and justice for all. Saying that every single day ends up making you rather stupid. And I didn't know the truth about my country when I was 19 years old. I was an ignorant kid, and like so many other Americans, I didn't realize that until later. But thank God, I actually woke up at some point and realized the truth. Well, let, let's, okay. let's move forward with this. Stuart Sogol, uh, inside Syria, you have a problem. Uh, aside from uh, what's going to happen in terms of military strike, there's going to be casualties. Uh, I mean, uh, if we want to look at missile strikes coming in terms of Tomahawk missiles, you're going to have people that may die because of this. There's also reports coming out that tens of thousands of Syrian refugees are returning from Lebanon to stand with their government. You have people inside Damascus that are uh, forming human shields around certain important uh, places. I mean, uh, is what's going to happen when you're going to have civilian casualties that could be a consequence of this military action? Again, my reading is that they're not going to go after military bases per se. They're going to go after the anti-aircraft uh, air defense system. Uh, so if there are any casualties, you can blame it on the Syrian government. As with Saddam Hussein, I still remember during the first Gulf War, and that little child, Stuart, had him on his lap. Stuart, have you eaten your cornflakes yet? I mean, it was in this, this kind of nonsense where these folks purposely take civilians, put them in areas which they fear are going to be hit, and then when they are hit, they are hit, then they complain that the Americans or the other side, they're destroying or they're killing the civilians. They know full well what may be attacked, and it can easily keep civilians away from that. So there's really very little sympathy when you know the targets that are going to be attacked, and the government on the ground puts civilians there. They're the ones who are slaughtering those folks, not the American military. Do you agree with that, Ken O'Keefe? <laughs> Absolutely not. If a nation from halfway around the world that had a history of violent, aggressive acts, including state-sponsored terrorism, were banging down the doors of the United States or Britain and threatening us with attacks, with bombings, and so on and so forth, we would have every right to defend ourselves with whatever means we had. The people of Syria are voluntarily subjecting themselves to a potential harm, in fact, in, in potential death, because they know that the fall of the Assad government and the destruction of Syria, as designed by those who fantasize about the Greater Israel Project, who want to destabilize and create sectarian divide and merciless killing for generations to come, that they have to do everything they can to defend their country. And the only thing they really have, many of them, is their bodies. So they are voluntarily submitting to that, and you have to admire, you have to admire their strength and courage in doing so. What I would also say is that the tactic of using human shields, which is something that's close to my heart since I initiated the human shield action to Iraq back in 2002, 2003, is that the importance of human shields for foreign human shields, if indeed they are used, is that they must be deployed to places that are supposed to be protected by the Geneva Convention. So if what this gentleman says is true, which it's not, but let's just say that it is true, and they only intend to attack military sites, unlike what they did in Iraq, which is they attacked all sorts of civilian sites, such as water treatment facilities and uh, electrical power plants, food storage sites, 
if human shields are deployed to sites that are supposed to be protected by the Fort Geneva Convention, and those sites are attacked by the United States, then let it be known first and foremost and forever that the United States is in fact nothing more than a patent war criminal who has attacked sites that are critical to the civilian population, which punishes not Bashar al-Assad, but the civilians, women and children who will die from dysentery and other diseases out of waterborne carrying diseases and all sorts of other nonsense. This is the truth. The United States will attack the infrastructure just as it did with Iraq. If we recall back in 2002, 2003, in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq, they also said, oh, we don't intend to attack the infrastructure. That was a lie. Everything that comes out of the mouths of people like John Kerry and Barack Obama and every other stooge that came before them is a lie. How do you know they're lying? They open their mouth, you know they're lying. Well, one of the things that Barack Obama did say, Stuart Stogel, uh, unless you have a reaction again, uh, but I, I'd like to, since we're uh, uh, coming short of time, it was very interesting what Barack Obama said in his presser over in Sweden, uh, Stuart Stogel, and he said that when something ha bad happens in the world, uh, everybody uh, is wondering what the U.S. is going to do next, what action they're going to take. And I'm going to line that up with what uh, the lawmaker Engel said in the House Foreign uh, Relations Committee. He said that the issue we confront today is about the credibility of global American power. I mean, why is it that the U.S. thinks that it has to be policing the world? Why does it have to exert its global power? Is it that afraid of what, of what perhaps you can tell us? What, what is it that makes them feel they have to always be on top of this? Oh, I'll answer rather briefly. Let's get right back to Syria rather quickly. If we held open and fair elections today, internationally supervised, you think the Assad government would, would win election? I'm not so sure about that. Why is the American government supposedly the world's policemen, they're doing some of the dirty work that other folks want to do, but don't want to take the political heat. Because if the Americans don't do it, nobody else will, and you'll see complete chaos. So and it's rather ironic that everyone's calling Barack Hussein Obama a warmonger. When he ran for election in 2008, this was supposedly the liberal person who was going to put America on a more even keel and wasn't going to run around being the world's policeman. That was his campaign problem, uh, his campaign rhetoric. Now all of a sudden, about the only person who seems to have committed more war crimes than Barack Obama is Adolf Hitler. And Ken O'Keefe, uh, Stuart Stogles talks about how uh, the U.S. is doing the dirty work. I was under the impression that it was the al Qaeda insurgents that are related to the U.S. in terms of the backing from the U.S. doing the dirty work. Your final comments. Well, let's be clear about this. We have no doubt that al-Qaeda associates, uh, al-Nusra Front, who were caught with two kilos of sarin gas in Turkey, that's not Syria reporting that, that's the Turks. And we know that we have provided material support to the so-called rebels in Syria. We also know that there are accusations that Israel provided the sarin gas to Prince Bandar, Bandar Bush as he's known, um, who delivered those uh, chemicals to the so-called rebels in Ghouta for the recent massacre. That's the rebels themselves who are saying that. So if that be true, and I believe it is, Barack Obama has provided material support to Al-Qaeda and this whole war on terror that we supposedly fought for the last uh, 12 years is nothing more than a farce used to justify military aggression by the United States at the behest of the banksters. That's my assessment of what's happening and I can defend it with more time if I had it. Well, hopefully we'll have you back in another debate. Thank you very much. But that's it for this edition. Let me thank former U.S. Marine and war veteran Kenneth O'Keefe who was just talking there from London and from Newsmax magazine Stuart Stogel gave us his comments from New York. Thank you for watching another edition of The Debate from Mika Batahwe and the entire team in the capital of Tehran. It's goodbye.